welcome to Business Basics for Early Stage Founders, um, put on by Startout. Um, why don't we go to the next slide? So Startout uh, is a US-based nonprofit founded in 2009. And, and really our, our focus and our goal here is to support LGBTQ plus entrepreneurs and startup founders. Um, the, this, this was a, a, a space that Startout identified um, that needed some more uh, concerted effort. And so the mission really is to increase the number, um, the diversity and the impact that LGBTQ entrepreneurs have um, and to amplify their stories so that we can you know, have them be economic drivers within the queer community. And over the last, you know, more than a decade, um, Startout has built a community of over 18,000 members. Uh, we support more than 300 entrepreneurs every year. Um, and Startout's really sort of an, an all-purpose networking community. Um, and so you'll see uh, on the slide there, just a list of some of what Startout has to offer. Uh, there's the Growth Lab, Growth Lab, which is the only LGBT accelerator. Um, and the start out growth lab graduates have raised over a hundred million dollars in funding. There are over 300 mentors. I'm one of the mentors. Um, there's more than a hundred active mentorship relationships. Um, they, we've got experts as you'll see tonight in all different areas in fundraising and marketing and PR, um, a huge investor network and, you know, put on, uh, 50 or more events a year. Um, the one thing I would, I would personally plug is the, the network and, and forum, um, which is really a great way to, to connect with folks and kind of continue the networking. Um, so why don't we go on to the next slide. And start out is, of course, very thankful to its sponsors. You'll see our sponsors listed there. Um, special thank you tonight um, to the sponsors that have provided panelists for us, and that would be Ogilvy, Twilio, uh, Partners for Growth, and Foley and Lardner. Um, and I'll introduce the panelists uh, in a little bit, and you'll get to hear more from them. And then just before we get into the introductions, um, two things to put on your calendar. December 15th, uh, there's going to be an NDA 101. Um, that's non-disclosure agreements. So that is uh, going to be an important one for folks, uh, particularly who have um, intellectual property. Um, and then on December 29th, there's going to be a networking and community event, Wednesday Wind Up. And that is a great way if you want to start the New Year celebrations a little bit early. And so now I will introduce our panelists and what I'll do is give sort of a little overview of who everyone is and then give them each an opportunity to add anything uh, that they wanted to about their background and to answer the, a fun question for us, which is what should an early stage founder from your perspective be doing that most don't? And I'll repeat the question after I in introduce each person. So, um, but that, that can, you guys can start thinking about that. Um, so my name is Michael Thompson. I'm a partner at Prince LaBelle Tie here in Boston. I saw there was at least one person from Boston in the chat. So shout out to Boston. Um, my practice is in business litigation. Um, I, as I mentioned, I also serve as a, um, a mentor for start out and um, have really just been interested in, in startups and, you know, helping others realize their ideas um, for a company. So the first panelist I'll introduce is Jeff Allen. And Jeff is our sort of funding guru. He is a managing director at Partners for Growth, which is a late stage technology lending firm. Um, Jeff has a, a really broad range of um, expertise in, in funding matters. What he does at Partners for Growth is uh, focus on sourcing and, and structuring new transactions for them. Um, and so, Jeff, if you want to give us anything else about yourself and give us something that you think early stage folks should be thinking about and they often don't. Yeah. Um, thanks, Michael. Um, 
Awesome, Jeff, everybody. Uh, I've been with PFG for about 10 years. Um, we're a venture debt or a technology debt fund based out of the SF Bay area, um, which is basically another capital solution um, for growing companies um, as an alternative to traditional um, equity venture capital. So happy to answer any questions that anybody might have about um, funding for a business and, and growth resources for companies. Um, something that uh, founders don't always think about that, that maybe they should, um, I guess from the funding perspective, maybe just a really basic one of, do you even need to raise institutional capital? That, that's kind of a basic question of, there's lots of ways to, to build a company um, and there's a lot of successful companies and doesn't necessarily have to be through formal institutional means. Um, so there's a lot to be said for, uh, you know, building it slow and steady and kind of a closely held perspective. So um, sometimes it's easy to get wrapped up in a lot of the, the news and headlines and some of the tech press. So um, maybe just something to think about when you're in the, the super early stages of building your idea. Great, thanks, Jeff. Uh, so next up, I'll introduce Nikki Rubin. And Nikki is a, I, I love Nikki's title, a startup evangelist at Twilio. And Twilio really focuses on helping very early stage um, companies. So before pre-series A, um, founders grow and scale their communications. Um, so Nikki is, is here to provide her expertise from a business strategy perspective. She is also an entrepreneur and founder herself. Um, so Nikki, if you want to tell us anything else about yourself and what's something that early stage founders should be thinking about, but sometimes don't. Sure. Well, thank you so much for having me tonight. I'm really excited to be here. Um, I think you covered it. So at Twilio, I get to work with startup founders all day. So if you need help, please let me know. Um, and I guess from a Twilio perspective, uh, one thing I would say that startup founders should do that they probably don't do from the beginning um, is get a business phone number. So when I was a startup founder, I gave everyone my cell phone number, did everything from my personal cell phone number. Uh, but quick piece of advice, get, get a business phone number. You can always get it forwarded to yourself, but uh, it's nice to have that separation and professionalism from the beginning. That is an awesome tip. Thank you. So next I'll introduce AJ Schumacher. He is an associate and an intellectual property lawyer at Foley and Lardner. Um, AJ focuses on trademark and copyright issues and I believe also has expertise in advertising law. Um, so AJ, if you want to give us a little bit more about yourself and what's something that early stage founders should be thinking about. Thanks. Um, yeah, I'm AJ Schumacher. I uh, am uh, associate at Foley Lardner. I've been here for about six years now or close to six years. Um, I counsel clients um, from you know, a variety of uh, the spectrum to Fortune 5 companies to you know, billion dollar brands to also you know, startups who are just trying to figure out what their name is going to be. Um, uh, and things that I think most startups or startups don't think about um, right away is trademark rights. And it's a plug for kind of my area of expertise, but you know, oftentimes it's so heavily patent focused. That's what kind of people think about um, when they think about their intellectual property because it's you can you know more readily um, commercialize patents than you can uh, for the most part for trademarks. Um, so, you know, the, I would just say that you can think about other forms of um, intellectual property that you are developing or that you need to be protecting. Um, it's, you know, it could be something as simple as your name or your logo or, you know, your photos that you're taking and putting on your website. Thanks. Thanks, AJ. And then last but definitely not least is Reed Littman. Reed is our expert in branding and marketing. He is a global consultant at Ogilvy and focuses on brand and marketing strategy um, for some pretty impressive brands around the world. Um, so Reed, what would you say is something that early stage founders should be thinking about? Yeah, thanks Michael, great to be here. Um, hope everyone's doing well. Um, if there's one thing I could sort of pop in from the Ogilvy perspective and from my perspective kind of on brand, it's that, um, you know, 78% of brands could disappear tomorrow and nobody would care. And that's a global survey. That being said, 81% of people feel like brands can impact the world. And so 
early on, even though uh, your priority is probably less on your advertising and much more on your product or MVP, I think it's important to ask the question, you know, what makes you relevant and what makes you unique and how can you be one of those brands that, that really has impact? Awesome, thank you. So if we're, if we're thinking about very, very early stage, you have an idea and you're wondering sort of what to do next. Um, I think I'll, I'll ask uh, Nikki, what's, I've got an idea and now what? <laughs> Sure. So um, I, I was that person. I did have an idea and then I asked now what? Um, and there's definitely, you know, a couple of things to get started. So one is I encourage everyone to write stuff down. So write down as much as you can start with mock-ups, start by thinking about, you know, what do you envision this product to look like? Who is your audience? Um, and it doesn't have to be perfect, um, but I would definitely start by writing it down. Um, and then the next thing I would do is share your idea. And so it might sound a little bit counterintuitive um, and I'd love to get you know the, the uh, law perspective on this as well. Um, but you know, start sharing it with people in your network, start sharing it with people that you trust um, and you value their opinions um, and really ask them for honest feedback. Um, and then from there, you can start developing your MVP and, and get started. I, really, I actually have written down as um, you know, one thing that founder, founders need to know is that ideas generally are not protectable from an intellectual property standpoint. Uh, right. they don't live right now, but, um, <laughs> A lot of people are also like, oh, somebody stole my idea. And it's like, well, kind of, you know, tough luck on my <laughs> So you can share it, but not maybe uh, if you think it's a real good one, you might want to kind of develop it a little bit first. And AJ, there, there's a, we just got a question in the chat about NDAs. Um, and I'll, I'll sort of try to summarize the question, but um, the issue here is that the there there's a, a funding op pitch opportunity, um, but the the funding program does not require participants to sign an NDA, and um, it sounds like this founder is wondering, you know, is that is that an okay thing? Is that a typical thing? Um, and maybe some ways to approach that. So if I'm just truth telling, um, and I don't work do a whole lot of uh, work with NDAs. Um, usually on like the life sciences and the patent background. Um, but I, so I can't really open in on like whether it's like market um, or not. Uh, but, you know, I would just say to do what you, is comfortable for you. And if, if you're if you're having doubts about it, um, you know, consult uh, an expert or um, do what you think is best for you. And Jeff, from a sort of funding perspective, do you have any thoughts on the NDA and, you know, should, should founders be sort of requiring that there be an NDA? Um, I, I think it's up to the founder and, and kind of a personal decision of how comfortable they are. I, I know just at least from PFG's perspective, you know, of all the, you know, we speak to hundreds, if not um, over a thousand companies every year. And with many of them, we put an NDA in place. Um, and with, but we kind of take the, the founder's lead and, and with some, you know, they're, they're not focused on that and, and they don't want to kind of spin cycles there. Um, you know, we just have a policy that everything is always confidential with, within PFG. So I think it's really kind of up to the founder, um, you know, maybe how sensitive they are with, with the information that they're sharing. Um, so Reed, I have sort of a, a different question for you um, along the lines of, you know, I've got an idea what next is there is sort is there sort of a step one from a branding marketing perspective yeah it's a, it's a good question i don't know if there's a definitive step one but there's certainly um you know a few things to think about post that idea um when when we're kind of moving into the brand and, and marketing side of things uh first i think it's really useful and more and more the norm early on like first few weeks to, to sort of jot down even roughly your brand or your really your brand purpose. So like, why do you exist? What is the impact you want to have on the world? Um, start to think about your visual identity. How do you kind of stand out in this crazy digital world where there's, you know, new colors and rebrands every other day? Um, think about your target. 
who are the three or four people who are going to find your product more use most useful um and then other things too like uh partnership strategy for example as you you know maybe don't have a huge budget to get your name and likeness out there um who are people who naturally benefit from your product who you know can work with you to help uh, gain exposure in those early days nice I'll throw a, a, a toss-up question out there. So anyone who wants to address it, go for it. Um, so you, how do you, what are steps that founders should take to make sure that their idea is unique and actually going to be something people want? Sure, I can, I can start here. Um, I think the most important thing is to talk to potential customers. Um, so what you want to do is you want to find people that you think may or may not be interested um, in what you're doing um, and either get them on a Zoom call or, you know, somehow get them on a, a phone call and ask them, you know, would you be interested in this? Describe what you're doing. Um, I oftentimes recommend, you know, sending out surveys um, to see if people are interested. Uh, you can always do like a, a, a landing page describing what you're doing and ask people to sign up um, and let them know that it's coming soon. Uh, but I think the most important thing is to really wear the customer's shoes and to understand where they're coming from um, and to get their feedback from the beginning and, and trust it. Yeah, it's really, it's really awesome. No, go ahead, Reed. I yeah, I can jump in too. I, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think, you know, we live in a, a world where you can go on uh, Instagram and post a story and get instant feedback on a product or idea from, you know, thousands of people across all different geographies. So um, even from the earliest states, think about your point of view on sort of community building and getting feedback early on. And then, you know, that can be kind of your, your squad as you move forward, if, if, whether it's sort of getting feedback on a product that you can then fix or whether it's they love the product and you have you know, your first few customers. I, I love that. Just like basically do your own market research. And I love the idea of using social media as a, as a way to, you've got, you know, in a, a ready audience. Yeah, have to. <laughs> so AJ, no one likes to talk to the lawyer. I, I know. I was going to say, Reed and I are probably going to disagree a lot. Because the legal is always telling me advertising people are the wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so what? What are what? What? What should folks talk to their lawyers about, even if they don't want to, if they're at the beginning stages? So the thing that we I find to be like the biggest issue is, um, you know, obviously this is because we come across this the most. It's just the naming of their companies. A lot of times people will just, you know, start off, they may have done some, you know, Google searching or what have you before they uh, launch their product, but they'll be, you know, three or four years in, and then they'll start thinking about their trademark and registering their name, you know, because they have people are infringing their website or whatever. And um, sometimes it's too late or it's, you know, too expensive at that point to kind of create to fix the problem and they often end up having to rebrand or they can't get a registration for their trademark. Um, so it's just something that I think you should think about sooner rather than later, even if, you know, they, they end up you send a thousand bucks or so doing it. Um, it's worth it. Uh, trust me. I have had clients that have, you know, are there attached to their names and, you know, they get big enough five years in and somebody tells them, no, no, you're not going to do this anymore. And they, you know, they have to spend uh, they entirely change their business and their websites and all sorts of things. So it's a huge, it can be a huge pain. So I encourage people to think about it sooner rather than later. Um, and, you know, if you have access to the funds and whatever to, to spend money to, to do it correctly. Actually, we just got a question in the chat that um, I think is a good one. Are there any components of a business website that need to be reviewed by a lawyer? <laughs> Uh, yes, <laughs> um, uh, oh, like not everything, but, um, you know, a lot of, I, a lot of times we find people are just, they think things are on the internet so that they can repurpose it and reuse it, which is not the case. Um, so, you know, it's whether it's somebody's photo or their article, um, you know, there are copyright issues that are come along with that. The other thing, um, 
their advertising claims, like the claims that you're making about your products have to pass, you know, meet a certain standard that I don't necessarily need to get into right now, but um, just try to be as truthful and honest and not misleading as possible when you're making claims about your products. Um, and if you have like a very technical uh, product that, you know, you can say, if you're saying something like this works three times faster than, you know, the, my, my competitor, um, you need to make sure that you have, you know, substantiation. You have to be able to back that, 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 that claim up with data. Um, so the short answer is yes, there's a lot of things that need to be reviewed on websites. So Jeff, I have some money questions. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that uh, in, in your introduction um, to think about whether you actually really need institutional investment. Is there, are there signs or is there a stage where, you know, it's like, okay, now, now is the time to start thinking about institutional investors. Yeah. Yeah. Great, great question, Michael. Um, I, I think the, the place it starts is with the founding team and, Kind of what is their goal and what is their vision for the business that they want to build or for the company um you can kind of you know some folks you know they they want to create a rocket ship and you know they have massive ambitions right um that probably is going to need outside capital to to help get there um but other folks might be more wired towards building um you know kind of a steady growth business or and i don't say this with any bad connotations, but you know, more of a lifestyle business or something that is still a healthy company and can have a great product, um, but you aren't necessarily tying yourselves to expectations of kind of outside professional investors. Um, so it, I think it starts with the, the founder of, of kind of what the goals are for the business. Um, and then from that, you know, based on the type of company, um, are you looking to, to build a business where it's kind of generating revenue from customers right out of the get-go. And, you know, some, some folks are lucky enough or fortunate enough with their model to be, you know, kind of break even or profitable with early products. Um, whereas other types of businesses, you know, might need outside capital and going to be in, in burn mode for a while. So there's a few things like that that are, I think are good kind of starting points to think about um, in terms of when and, and if it makes sense to um, bring in outside capital. So one, uh, oh wow, we have a, a bunch of questions. So one question that came in is for a growing speaking business, do you recommend business liability insurance? Does anyone have any insurance background or I can at least try to field this one? Yeah, I think that's, that's more, maybe more your expertise, although okay. maybe after um, the fact. <laughs> <laughs> I part part of my career has been in uh, doing in, insurance coverage disputes, and um, the the short answer and the lawyer answer is yes, you need business liability insurance. Um, the 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 piece, the tricky piece is sort of the when, um, and you, part of it is understanding what business liability insurance covers and what coverages you are trying to, what are the events that you're trying to protect against? Um, so, you know, if you, if you have, if you're at the very early stages and you're, you don't have a product that's going anywhere, um, that's not being disseminated to people, then you probably don't need a, a comprehensive general liability insurance policy. Um, if you're in a, a profession, an industry um, that has professional regulations, then um, maybe you do want some, some professional liability insurance. So the, the best way to answer the insurance question is to think about what are the risks I'm trying to protect against, um, and then get with a broker and see you know, what, what they can offer um, to, to protect against those sorts of risks. Um, oh, another funding question. Um, when is when are government grants and funding not something that you want to do? When are um, hmm, that's a, a good question. Um, I, in terms of grants, I mean, I guess I I, I would say if you know if, if there are 
government programs and, and grants that are available and relatively easy to access for your, your type of business, then, uh, you know, as long as there's not a huge number of strings attached, you know, that's probably fine. I, I guess just the one thing to keep in mind that sometimes some of those programs, um, you also want to think about kind of the trade off of the time and the effort to access them and how much firepower it might be getting you um, versus just, you know, taking a, a founding team's time away from, say, building that MVP or, or hiring the next folks you're looking for. Um, so, you know, maybe just thinking about how much, you know, how helpful uh, a given program might be. Um, at, but to the extent that it's a grant where you're, you're not having to pay it back and it's not forcing your company um, to develop a product or into a particular area that you don't want to go, then um, I, I don't think there's a huge downside to it. Uh, the one thing I, I would add to that is, is um, yeah, I think that's right, but you want to look at the process for applying for the funding and sort of do a little cost benefit because it, and yep, you know, for sure, five hours that you're putting in applying for this is five hours. You're not putting into something else. Um, there, there's a follow-up on that for government funding. What is the best process to evaluate the strings attached? I'm it, not sure that. Yeah. I mean, this would easily be answerable. Yeah, it wouldn't be a definitive answer, but, um, you know, I think sometimes there can be um, sort of reporting requirements and, and you might need to update, you know, the, the group that you access, you know, that grant or, or that government funding from. And, and so kind of back to, to your point a little bit, Michael, just keeping in mind the trade off um, the opportunity cost of, you know, is it going to be worth your while if it's a relatively small amount and, and how much extra reporting and, you um, sort of feedback are they going to need is, is something to keep in mind. So another sort of toss up question. Um, I've got an, I've got my idea. I've done a little legwork. It seems like it's going to work. So how do I communicate the intention, the mission, the purpose? Like, how do I tell people about this? <laughs> Yeah, I can start with this one. Um, so there are many different ways. I mean, we talked a bit about social media and getting your message out there. Um, but something else I would suggest is positioning yourself as a thought leader in the space. Um, and a really great and kind of easy way to do that um, is to start a newsletter. So um, if you are, you know, reading certain articles or if you're working with certain people and they want to do, you know, a guest post or something on your newsletter, um, it's a really great way to start building kind of momentum early on. Um, and it's usually pretty simple to set up and do. Um, so I usually recommend that early stage founders think about, you know, how they can create a newsletter, how they can, you know, position themselves. Um, and how they can also curate content rather than creating all the content. So um, I actually started my career in the art world a while ago. And so I'm really into this idea of curation, especially because as a startup founder, you have limited time, limited resources. So if you can create thought leadership by, you know, doing links that you love um, or, you know, bringing in other people uh, to, you know, interview and stuff like that. Um, it's a really great way to get started and to uh, get customers and keep those relationships warm while you're building your product. Yeah, I love that. And I can jump in on this one as well. I think an interesting sort of mindset shift at the beginning is to think of your, your, your brand as, I guess I would say, think of like your your, your brand as less of a landing page or your social media as less of kind of a passive page and more of a destination with sort of known expertise and experiences that you can start to offer. Um, and that can be like, like we've said, like through thought leadership, or it can be through sort of developing some sort of a platform idea where you can begin to sort of provide value or um, allow other people to, to build with you. Um, and the interesting thing about sort of becoming a platform to help other people achieve things is, is that if you don't have a budget to create your own content, when you help people, you can actually then just request for free that they share with you what, what, what they're doing relevant uh, or related to your brand in which you're sort of crowdsourcing content then that, that feeds itself and, and only continues to grow more. 
there's sort of a follow-up question to that. Um, we have someone who's attending who has a logo, has a brand message, not a proponent of Twitter or Instagram, and will most likely use LinkedIn for initial business outreach uh, for a digital marketing company. Any other suggestions? Yeah, I think Substack, Discord, LinkedIn. I would encourage you to think uh, about Twitter, even if you're averse to the, you know, the Instagrams of the world. Um, marketing Twitter can be a very sort of helpful place. Some people even say marketing Twitter has replaced LinkedIn. Um, but yeah, those are my big three, Substack, Discord, um, and, and LinkedIn. So AJ, I know you're not a patent lawyer, but there's sort of a patent related question that I think you can probably field. <laughs> um, the, the question is, uh, say we have an idea for a medical instrument. Should I bootstrap to get a patent before approaching potential developing companies slash potential investors to make it happen? Uh, so again, I don't you know, practice patent law day to day, um, but generally patents, one of the like requirements of patent eligibility is kind of it has to you know not be disclosed prior to um, or has, it can't be out there already and not obvious and disclosed. So I, I think you know the general it's generally safer um, and more the more conservative approach is to kind of get the patent first before you start telling people about your patented idea and offering your patent product um, for sale or licensing or whatever. I agree with that, even though I'm, <laughs> I'm also not a patent lawyer, but um, I mean, patents, they, there there really is a benefit um, to, you need to be first. <laughs> um, so you want to get there as early as possible. So this is a little bit different. This is kind of a talent acquisition question. It's hard to find the right kind of PhD slash postdoctoral candidate. How do, uh, how do we make the startup company look more attractive to those folks? Because large companies are their first choice. Um, do you increase the salary, increase um, stock options? Any thoughts on finding or retaining the right talent? I can say from a purely non-monetary point of view, almost a, a storytelling point of view, um, we've been trying to attract sort of talent, it's interesting to, number one, kind of perfect your mission and your goal. And then number two, sort of frame that goal in terms of like, if there's a few different things, like you could frame it as what, what enemy are you defeating? Or like, what is your shared goal that, that you can kind of accomplish in a way that is more nimble, more scrappy and more real than could be accomplished at sort of a large, more traditional company. Um, or like what voices are you amplifying or what is the shared agenda that's probably too new or too maybe cutting edge or even um, impractical for a, a larger existing company? Yeah, I would add to that um, similarly to think about your company's values um, and to share those with potential candidates um, because that's often really important to people uh, when they're you know, choosing where they're working, they wanna feel that the values are aligned with theirs. Um, so I would go with that. And of course, obviously, you know, adding benefits is, is always helpful. Great. I love the, I love the thoughts on like non-monetary ways to do this. Sorry, Reed, I yeah. think I interrupted you. No, all good. I was just going to add one other thing, which is it can also be great one, you know, I think a lot of people or a lot of brands sort of know, um, their purpose and it's on their website and such. But in recruiting talent, it can be really interesting to show actually how that purpose sort of permeates all of the different aspects of the business. So given purpose X, you know, how, what is, how does that affect your leadership in a unique way? What's different about your employee experience because of that uh, purpose? How does that purpose affect your innovation strategy or your products and services? And like being able to tell that full story um, is I think, super attractive to, to candidates. Nice. I might just chime in briefly too. I think, especially if you're looking to recruit, um, you know, highly educated, you know, very technical or specialized folks um, with say, you know, PhD training in something that, you know, that purpose and mission aspect of 
trying to, to bring somebody on board, you know, frankly might resonate even more so than, um, you know, kind of the salary number of the benefits. I mean, of course that's important, but um, it's just going to be so tough for, for a real small company typically to compete with, you know, what a large business can offer salary wise. And so you got to, got to come with the, the mission and purpose element and, and get people fired up about what it is that your company is doing and, and what you guys are focused on building. So we also have a question. What is the typical percentage offered on a SAFE, S-A-F-E note, um, which seems to be an acronym that I don't know. So if someone knows the answer to the question, it'd be great to know what a SAFE note is. <laughs> Yeah, I, I can take that. Um, I, I think it's a, a simple agreement uh, for equity. Um, and, and the idea behind a safe note is opposed to um, bringing on traditional equity and pricing that investment at a specific valuation. Um, a safe note, basically you can raise money and then it can, it's in sort of a more standardized format. And then it can convert an equity into equity at um, a later round, you know, if you bring on institutional capital down the road and you don't want to fix a valuation um, right at that point. So the, the idea behind it is kind of streamlining some of the paperwork and having a sort of set template to be able to bring in some, some early capital without having to stick a number on your company. Um, and, and sorry, the other part of the question, Michael, just. Uh, I think it was what, uh, was what, percentage typically is offered? Yeah, so I mean, that's, you know, there, there's typically um, a cap on it. So it might say, hey, you know, this this million bucks in a safe note, um, you know, it's either going to con convert into your subsequent equity raise, um, maybe at a discount or over a given period of time, or if, the, if you don't raise um, an investment round over a certain period of time, then maybe there's a cap amount where it automatically converts at sort of a fixed number if there isn't a future investment. So um, as far as the, the typical rate, um, you know, if there's kind of like a, an accruing interest portion or something, if, if that might be part of it, um, you know, probably anywhere from sort of the, you know, mid to high single digits to kind of, you know, low teens or something would, would probably be, be typical, um, something in that range. Nice, thank you. So this is, this is a pretty broad question, um, but I kind of like it. Before you even have the idea, how do you get a, a fascinating idea for a startup? Like where, where do the ideas come from? I mean, what you really want to do is solve a problem. So you want to make sure that um, when you're thinking of your idea, that it's not necessarily something that's nice to have. It's something that people need to have. Um, and oftentimes with founders, there is a personal story behind it. So um, it could be something that, you know, that you've experienced personally or a friend or family member. Uh, it doesn't have to be, um, but uh, that's usually a good place to start. Any other thoughts on just where these ideas even come from? Okay, well, yeah, here's I a, mean, no, go ahead. I was just gonna say, you know, sometimes it could be um, something that's been been bugging you. I mean, just following on Nikki's point, you know, it often comes from the founder. So maybe there's, there's a problem that's always irked you or it just, you know, you've always wanted something and, and you can't find it anywhere and, you know, I'm going to build it myself. You know, this has just been, you know, I've had this, this bug and I can't, can't get, you know, rid of it. And, and now I'm going to go after it. So um, I think it really probably has to, has to start with kind of the, the passion from the founder um, is, is really important. Yeah. Maybe, I think honestly, the solving the problem is the, the best answer. If, if, if I had to add something, I would say to think about, um, sort of where we are in the world right now, like coming out of COVID, what, what has changed in your community? What, what do you think um, will continue to grow or stop? And then how can you kind of become a part of those 
those cultural trends and, and build a community around it and, and offer something that you and the people around you would find valuable. Awesome. Those are, those are great ideas about getting ideas. So we, we started off talking about kind of what's one thing that fo folks in the early stages should be thinking about that they're not. Um, this is maybe the flip side of that question. What is the number one most common mistake founders make? You have to have seen some, some folks getting off on the wrong foot. I yeah, I, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, you go ahead, you go ahead. Um, I would say kind of what I was talking about before, uh, just the flip side of it, which is not listening to customers. Um, and so, you know, there's definitely cases where as a founder, and I, I have this too, where customers said to me, no, we don't need this. And I was like, no, no, you do. You just don't know you need it yet. Um, so, you know, that, that does exist. Um, but in general, um, I would say, you know, losing touch with your customers, not understanding what they're doing, uh, not communicating with them properly. I think that's really key is you always want to communicate with your customers, you know, through their preferred channels um, and make sure that they're having a good experience um, because things inevitably, you know, go wrong at some point. And so you want to make sure you're always supporting your customers, listening to them, thinking about things from their perspective. Um, so I would say that that's the most common mistake I've seen is, is not listening as closely to their customers as they should be. AJ, you are muted. Oh, um, I don't know if this is the most common mistake, but um, it kind of snowball or dovetails with what um, Mickey said. Is, you know, sometimes I see that they just they don't listen to the advice that's offered to them, whether it's from you know their trusted advisors, whether it's a lawyer, or accountant, or whatever it is. Um, they sometimes it's kind of like the mentality that I'm the founder and I know everything, and it's you know not always the case, you have to trust the people that you have, you know, hired or um, consulted with. Obviously, sometimes there are exceptions, but um, I, I just find that sometimes people ignore, um, you know, counsel at their own detriment sometimes. Yeah, I think from like a marketing or brand point of view, um, there's, there's maybe people who put that, that side of the business on the back burner. Um, or think of brand as, you know, a logo instead of a destination, or they think of their brand and marketing as just a way to um, support their pricing strategy and not as, say, a, a strategic lever for, for growth. Or maybe brand to them is, is just a way to sort of solidify or, or show which audience you're going after, as opposed to a way to sort of really build kind of an ecosystem that, that drives choice and loyalty regardless of the demographic. Um, so I think those those elements of brand in the early days are what I'll advocate for as, as maybe getting lost sometimes. Okay, so we've got about two minutes left. So I'm gonna toss this, this Q&A question, I think probably to Jeff. Um, the, this is someone who's got Financial model, modeling that shows good cash flows and profits pretty quickly within the first two years. Um, there's demonstrated need. The biggest roadblock is they need a lot of capital to get off the ground, potentially around $5 million. Any advice on how to get a hefty amount of funding without giving up too much of the company equity? Yeah, I, I think the, the best place to start. So, um, sounds like if, if the business is not yet generating revenue, but um, anticipating that it's going to grow, you know, grow rapidly once things get online, um, I think researching the types of investors and reaching out to folks that focus in your area. So if you're, you know, a direct to consumer business, for instance, making sure that you're speaking to um, equity investors or, you know, angel investors or, or or seed investors who focus on consumer businesses, or if you're an enterprise software company, making sure that you're speaking to the folks in that area. Um, 
I think that's probably the best place to start, um, especially when you're at the pre-revenue stage, um, because so many things are so perspective and obviously, um, you know, it's a higher risk kind of stage in the business. Um, so at, at a very first point, you want to make sure you're talking to the folks who um, have worked with companies, you know, in a tangential or, or similar area to, to what you're doing right now. Um, as far as minimizing the, 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 you know, how much equity to give up, I'd, that really comes down to sort of how compelling the, uh, the business case is and, you know, how much interest you can get um, a prospective investor, uh, you know, how interested you can get them in your company. So, um, but, but know who you're talking to and, and make sure you're matched um, in, uh, in that respect. Thank you. I think we need to sort of leave it there, but I want to thank the, the panelists for letting me shoot some, some sometimes difficult questions at them and for giving their expertise. Um, I believe that contact information is available. So um, if you want to reach out to anyone, please feel free. And otherwise I'll say, have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you all.